Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. So, on Monday it will be in line. <clears throat> okay, so uh, as we have discussed last time, we have talked about uh, simple periodic analog signals and composite periodic analog signals. And we said that the composite analog signals are more commonly and uh, uh, um, used for in communication systems <coughs> and um, composite uh, periodic signals can be represented using multiple simple periodic signals, right? So the simple periodic signals are the simplest representation for a periodic signal and we have uh, shown that uh, it's simplest because it has only one frequency component in the frequency domain. So I can represent the simple periodic signal, whether it's sine wave or cosine wave, I can represent it using one sample only in the frequency uh, uh, domain. So uh, today we are going to start with the Fourier analysis and uh, Fourier, of course, is the name of a, a very old scientist and what he uh, really did is that he analyzed the periodic and non-periodic signals and he came up with uh, a very <coughs> fundamental uh, theorem that, that states that really composite signals, any type of composite signals, can be represented using a, a frequency um, uh, uh, spectrum, okay? And what he said is that the, um, the composite signal is a combination of sine wave and cosine wave. So we can represent the composite signals using sine wave and cosine wave with different frequency and different amplitudes and different phases. So these are the three fundamental characteristics we talked about last time for any signal. We have the amplitude, we have the frequency or the cycle duration, and we have the phase. Okay, so by having multiple sine waves with different amplitudes and different frequency and different phases, I can use multiple of these sine waves to represent any composite signal. Okay, and that's a fundamental uh, uh, theorem because uh, this is what all the communication systems are, are based on. Okay, um, so. As, as uh, 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 more details to that, uh, if a composite signal is periodic, he actually went further in the analysis and he kind of divided this composition of the signals into two categories. One category is the composite signal is actually periodic. And what he stated is that if the composite signal is actually periodic, then you have discrete frequency representation, which means that um, if I have, for example, um, if I have uh, um, a signal like this, This is a composite signal, and this is periodic or non-periodic? Yeah. This is periodic, and um, this is the time domain, of course. Uh, according to Fourier, I can actually represent this in the frequency domain using discrete, uh, discrete samples, okay? Which means that this can be uh, represented using one, two, or maybe three components. Of course, it's, it's, it's not easy to, to, to do the conversion, but uh, the theorem actually states that this is possible. But there are some tools and, uh, and devices that can do that for you. I mean, luckily, you don't have to do it uh, yourself, okay? If, if you have a, a signal which is like this, it's non-periodic, and it doesn't have any pattern whatsoever, okay? So if this is the 
uh, the time domain, in the frequency domain, you end up with a continuous frequency representation of that signal. Okay? So that's what he said. And proved, of course. Okay? So this is a very fundamental uh, theorem, of course, because as I said, in communication systems, people have found that dealing with the signals in the frequency domain is in many ways very, very useful and much easier than dealing with the signal in the time domain. So, um, according to Fourier, if the signal itself is analog and periodic, I can represent that in the frequency domain using discrete samples. Okay? And if the signal is aperiodic or non-periodic, then I can represent it using continuous uh, signal in the frequency domain. Okay? Um, what was that? All right. So, the theorem, of course. And as an example, we show a periodic composite signal with frequency f. When I say a, a, a composite signal with frequency f, um, f here, any composite signal, as we said before, any composite signal has more than one frequency, right? But when I say with frequency f, here I mean uh, what they call the fundamental frequency. And we'll show you that in a second. So, so this is just... Hmm? You mean the if, yes, it's in many ways the fundamental frequency represents uh, uh, the bandwidth, and we'll talk about bandwidth later on. Okay. So this type of signal is not typical uh, of those found in data communication. Uh, we can consider it to be like any example, like uh, the composite signal that we have just that I have just uh, shown you. Uh, this can be a signal which is output from an alarm system or something like that, or a clock or something like this. Uh, and if you have three clocks, each one generates a frequency, uh, uh, a different frequency, and then you sum all the three signals up, then you come up with a composite signal that looks like a... So this actually represents three simple signals summed up together. So uh, the fundamental frequency uh, is actually the, the frequency from here to here. And of course, there is some changes here. Okay? So the frequency of the signal, the fundamental frequency of the signal, talks about the, this, this period here. Okay? Um, so this composite signal can, in fact, be represented using... Okay? And again, uh, it's not us who will, who will actually break it down. There are some tools and, and devices that can do that for you. Uh, and uh, it's, it's very simple because if you can use like some filter, then you can get these frequency components individually and come up with these different signals. It's not, it's not actually uh, a big deal. But uh, what we need to worry about here is that uh, if we can break it down into three sine waves in the time domain, then it becomes clear to us that each sine wave uh, can be represented using one sample in the frequency domain, which means that this composite signal can be represented using three different components in the frequency domain. Okay? Each one of these, we call it harmonic. So each, each, each of these frequency, we call it a Harmonic. So this is the fundamental frequency, as I said, which corresponds to this big sine wave. Okay? And this um, uh, represents the fundamental frequency. Okay? This is the fundamental frequency, and um, we call it in the frequency domain the first harmonic. The first harmonic. And this is the third harmonic. And this is the ninth harmonic. This is an example, by the way, that the fundamental frequency 
does not actually represent the values. That's why I said in many cases, but not in all cases. Okay. So any questions so far? So that any composite signal according to Fourier, because this periodic composite signal, uh, 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 I can represent it using uh, discrete frequencies. And in fact, here, as we can notice, the discrete signals are finite number of samples. Okay, because we will we we will uh, show you cases that the the the, num the the signal is discrete, but the number of samples is infinite, because the um, the the, uh, the sine wave itself does not end at any point in time, right? It's continuous, forever, right? So, uh, but luckily, uh, the representation for it in the frequency domain is discrete and finite. Okay, but we will see cases that this number of samples is actually infinite. Okay, so this is the fundamental frequency, and in frequency domain, we call it first harmonic, third harmonic, ninth harmonic. Ninth harmonic. This means that. The signal has no second harmonic, which means that the second harmonic has an amplitude of a zero. The fourth harmonic has an amplitude of zero, and so on. Okay. Um, so this is what Fourier has uh, uh, analyzed. So um, the next figure will show you an unperiodic composite signal. So because we 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 have. Uh, seeing that the periodic signal can be represented using a finite number of discrete samples. Okay. Um, say that this uh, composite non-periodic signal is generated from a microphone. So the microphone, when we talk in the microphone, it generates a signal that has no pattern. Of course, because our voice is naturally aperiodic. Okay, does not have a specific pattern. Okay, so um, according to Fourier, we can represent this non-periodic signal using EVA in the frequency domain. Hmm? Continuous. continuous, bro. Continuous uh, uh, signal or continuous uh, frequency representation. Okay, so that's how. Uh, so this is in general how it looks like. So if the signal itself is aperiodic like this, then in the frequency domain, we have continuous frequency representation. Okay, so that's, that's the, the result of type. Now, we want to characterize, as we have done for the analog signals in the time domain, we want to be able to characterize the, uh, uh, the signals in the frequency domain. So we characterize the, the, the analog signal in the, in the time domain using three things, right? Using amplitude, using frequency or cycle duration. They are interchangeably used. And the third one is a phase, right? So in the, in the frequency domain, people usually use what we call bandwidth. Okay? And bandwidth, just um, don't get confused that bandwidth has actually multiple definitions in multiple contexts. Okay? So try to stick with the definition that we will talk about here. Because in computer networks, you have talked about bandwidth in a, in a slightly different way. So here, the bandwidth is actually, of, uh, the, the bandwidth of any composite signal is a difference between highest and lowest frequency. Highest and lowest frequency. Okay. <clears throat> So, uh, 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 any co as we said, any composite signal can be uh, represented in the frequency domain using uh, discrete or continuous frequency representation. So, we try to find the highest frequency component in the signal, and we try to find the lowest, and then we, we get the difference between the two. This is what we call a, the bandwidth of the signal. Okay, and bandwidth is usually used or in, in commonly used to characterize the 
the analog signals. The analog signals in the time domain, which can be represented using discrete in the, in the frequency domain. Okay? Because we will see that there are, uh, in digital signals, digital signals, we, we talked about digital signals, and we define digital signals that these are the signals that use finite set of levels, right? Yani, different from the analog. Analog signal has continuous values, but digital signals, they have finite set of values. And we, we use different representation or different ways to characterize the digital signals. Okay? But usually for continuous analog signals, we use bandwidths a lot. Okay? So, <clears throat> so this is just a simple example. If you have um, a signal that looks like this, and this is actually in the time domain, this is, remember that this is a analog continuous signal and because the because the spectrum is discrete this means that in the time domain this signal should be a periodic signal right so the bandwidth of this signal is simply 5000 minus 1000 which means 4k 4 kilohertz this is the bandwidth of the signal okay and the bandwidth is always a difference between two things it's not it's not a single frequency. It's actually a difference between the highest and lowest frequency. Okay? And why, why, what, what is the practical meaning of the bandwidth? Why do we need to measure the bandwidth? This is a very uh, important characteristic of the signal because at the end of the day, what we need to do is just to send this signal over physical media, right? So if the, if the, if the signal itself has a bandwidth, and the physical media itself does not, cannot accommodate this bandwidth, you will end up with a, a distorted signal at the end. Totally deformed signal. We will talk about that. Okay? So the bandwidth is a very important characteristic because it indicates to us whether or not we can transfer, we can transport this signal over this particular physical medium. Okay? Um, so the, uh, the, this signal, so this signal is a, a, a continu in the time domain, it's a continuous, aperiodic signal, and it has this uh, continuous frequency representation, and it has the exact same bandwidth of, of this signal. So the two signals have the same bandwidth. But the difference is, this signal is, is periodic, this signal is aperiodic. <clears throat> and we can tell that from the frequency domain because of what we know from Fourier. Okay? So, <clears throat> very simple couple of examples. If, uh, <clears throat> if, a if a periodic signal, which means periodic signal, is decomposed into five sine waves with frequencies, 10, 300, uh, 100, 300, 500, 700, and 900. What is the bandwidth? It's simply the highest minus the lowest. So that, that's very easy. So 900 minus 100, which means 800 hertz. Uh, and that's how it looks like. <clears throat> and we know that it has, <clears throat> this is a, a, a composite signal, which is periodic. And uh, uh, because it's actually a composition of multiple periodic sine waves. And this is how it looks like in the frequency. So a periodic signal has a bandwidth of 20 hertz. So if you know the bandwidth, and you give me like lowest bandwidth, I can draw the signal for you, right? Because I know the, the bandwidth. So the highest bandwidth is 60 hertz. So the lowest bandwidth is 40 hertz, right? Because it starts from the highest, and then I subtract the bandwidth, I get the lowest, uh, the lowest, band, the lowest um, frequency. Okay? <clears throat> whether, whether I can draw the signal or discrete, this depends on uh, a piece of information that whether this signal is, was originally periodic or aperiodic, right? So if it's periodic, then I, I draw the signal using discrete samples, as, as, as the case here. So these are discrete samples. But if you don't tell me that this signal originally was periodic signal, then what, I, what I'm going to do is that I will, I will 
draw a continuous uh, frequency representation. Okay. So a non-periodic, uh, a non-periodic uh, composite signal has a bandwidth uh, of 200 kilohertz, with a middle frequency of uh, 140 kilohertz. So, so I have. At 140 kilohertz, this is the A, the central frequency. Okay, so it has any amplitude in, at, at this point. Okay, and because the bandwidth is uh, 200 kilohertz, so I know that the highest one is 240, and the lowest one is A is 40. Okay, because it's non-periodic. I'm expected to, to draw a continuous curve. So there is another piece of information that two extreme frequencies, extreme which means the highest and the lowest, okay? They have an amplitude of zero, which means that you have zero here and zero here. Okay? And we, we are supposed to draw continuous, so it becomes like this. Okay? <clears throat> So that's how the signal looks like in the frequency domain. And because it's continuous, which means that you know, this, is, this is how it looks like. Ah, uh, 40 N. Uh, uh, we, we said that the bandwidth is 200 K, right? And the central frequency, the central, the middle frequency is 140. Right? So the middle frequency, which means that you have two equal parts, right? So I have to divide 200 by 2, which means I have 100 kilohertz here and 100 kilohertz here. That's why this is called the middle frequency, right? Okay. So, so this is for uh, uh, the analog signals. So for, again, for the analog signals, uh, any composite analog signal can be represented using frequency representation. If the analog signal is periodic, we, we can use finite number of or discrete frequencies to represent the signal. If the, if the signal is aperiodic or non-periodic, then we can use continuous frequency representation. And this is, uh, and we characterize this using the bandwidth. And the bandwidth, as I said, is easy, to, is easy to be used for analog signals, right? For digital signals, however, the, the, the case is a little bit different. Why? For digital signal, we said that digital signals have uh, uh, finite levels, right? Which means that, in general, digital signals would look like this. So I have, let's say this is like a digital signal, okay, which has only one level, and so on. So this is an example of a digital signal. Why? Because it has finite set of levels. It has only two levels only, which I can represent using one or zero. Very simple, right? <coughs> Uh, why is bandwidth not uh, useful in that case? Well, if we look at this signal, what is the frequency of, of this signal? What are the frequency components of that signal? Let's see. This signal is actually, uh, 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 actually it's, it's composed of fixed value here and sharp change, like horizontal line that represents the, 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 the level, and then one vertical line. What is the frequency of the fixed line? A line with zero frequency. Okay. What is the frequency of this sharp change? Infinity, Infinity bravo. Okay, so, so this signal has frequency components that ranges from zero all the way to infinity. 
right? In fact, if I can represent this using Fourier analysis, I will end up with something like this. There is F, this is the frequency. There is one sample in zero frequency, and there is another sample here, and there is another sample here, and so on. And this will continue forever. And why did I uh, uh, draw sa samples like this, discrete samples? Because I know that the signal is periodic, probably. So this, if the signal is periodic, I can represent that using a discrete sample. So still, Fourier theorem applies here. So, but uh, if, I, if I have, if I have something like this, this is time domain, and I have signal like this, This is a digital signal, right? Because it has finite levels. Okay? So, it doesn't have any pattern. It's aperiodic. Right? So, um, it has frequency components that ranges again from zero all the way to E to infinity. And because it's a periodic signal, I can represent it using a continuous frequency representation, right? And you have a range of frequency from zero to infinity. It, it, it has any shape. I don't care. I don't care about the shape. Okay? But the bandwidth of the digital signal by default is A. So the bandwidth of any digital signal by default is E. Infinity, probably. So because it has frequency components that ranges from zero all the way to infinity. And we said that bandwidth, by definition, is the highest frequency, which is infinity, minus the lowest frequency, which is zero. So the bandwidth is by default E, infinity. This is a big challenge in communication systems. Right? This is actually uh, one of the biggest challenges in communication. So, um, so when you talk about digital signals, it becomes really tricky to represent digital signals in, uh, in communication systems. Why? Because the bandwidth of the digital signal is infinity. So why is that a problem? Well, because you cannot actually send the digital signal as is on the physical medium and expect to get an ideal signal at the end. It's not going to happen. Because any physical medium has a specific bandwidth, even fiber optics. And fiber optics has the maximum bandwidth you can ever think about. But still, it, its bandwidth is limited. Okay? And we have very challenging signal Again, uh, uh, digital signals are easy to represent information because information for us is zeros and ones, right? So we have finite states when it comes to representing information from the application level. It's, it's, it's very easy to use digital signals because we can easily say that this level corresponds to 101. This level corresponds to 0001 and so on. So at the end, we have finite state to represent the information, which, which, which is, is really attractive for us to use digital signals. But when it comes to communication systems, we, if we try to transport these digital signals on the physical medium, we have a big challenge. Regardless of the physical medium, whether it's a, a coaxial cable or STP or UTP or, uh, or fiber optics or, or wireless, any of this media will have finite band. Right? So, um, 
That's why it's a, it's a very uh, challenging problem to use digital signals for transmission, but we're, we have multiple ways that we will discuss. So initially here, what we need to uh, discuss before we get to how to transport the digital signals over the media is how to characterize, how to characterize the digital signal. So again, we characterize the, uh, the periodic analog signals in time domain using, again, amplitude, frequency, and phase. We characterize the, uh, 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 the, the, um, the same signal in the frequency domain using another added uh, 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 parameter, which is the bandwidth. So now, digital signals, we said that the bandwidth of the digital signals is by default infinity, so it's not actually useful. So what they have thought about in, in terms of representing the digital signal is what we call the bit rate. Okay, so the bit rate, so what is the definition of a So any digital signal like this, it can be represented using binary numbers, or we can represent the binary numbers using these digital signals. That's what we actually do in communication systems. And the number of these bits in one second is what we call a bit rate. Because we have finite levels, if we have, for example, two levels, two levels only, zero and one. Okay? So we'll see that this is one, zero, one, zero, whatever the pattern is. And then we calculate the number of bits that we can uh, 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 use for this, for this digital signal within one second, and we call that a, the bit rate. Okay? So <clears throat> because this digital signal has more than two values, so we, we had to use a two bits to represent each level. So for this, for this digital signal here, we have four levels. So we can use two bits to represent each level. So in that case, the number of bits are doubled, right? Because we are using more than two, two levels for the digital signal. So the number of bits becomes double, right? So each level can be, uh, uh, can be used for two bits instead of one. Because this level is one, one, this level is one, zero, this level is zero, one, and then this level is zero, zero. And again, for the same second, for the same duration, I was able to send double number of bits compared to this digital signal. Okay? Again, if I, if I were to use the bandwidth, the bandwidth of both signals is, a, is infinity. But here the bit rate allows me to, to characterize those two signals and distinguish one from the other. Okay? In doing that, there, is, there are some properties. There are some properties. As we said, uh, uh, if we have two levels, okay, I can use two bits, and therefore I, um, I use the number of changes in the, uh, uh, in the level to represent different bits, and therefore I can calculate the bit rate as the number of bits I can use for this, for this digital signal in one second. If, uh, if the number of uh, levels is more than two, then I have to use two bits. Okay? If the number of levels is eight, I have to use eight, three bits. Because in three bits, I have eight different combinations, ranging from zero, 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 all the way to one, 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 right? So if this signal has eight levels, then I end up with treble the bit rate. Right? I end up with treble the bit rate. Why? Because each level here is going to be represented using three bits. So in the exact same duration, I can put three bits instead of a one or two. So the number of bits will, a, will triple in that case. <clears throat> Uh, 
in general, the number of bits per level is actually log 2 the log 2 the number of levels. So if the signal has uh, two levels, log 2 to 2 is 1. So I can use one bit to represent the two levels. If the number of levels is 4, I need 2. If the number of levels is 8, I need 3. If the number of levels is 16, I need 4, and so on. Okay? And then, so by increasing the number of levels, levels for the digital signal, I can, the bit rate actually increases. So that's one way of, of characterizing the, uh, the, the signal which is more useful compared to bandwidth, because bandwidth is in general infinity. Um, so there are, there is the, the bit rate and the bit length. Remember that we talked about, we talked about, uh, <clears throat> we talked about the cycle duration, and then we talked about a lambda or the wavelength. The wavelength. And we said that the wavelength is the distance that the signal travels in a duration which is equal to the time duration. Okay? In digital signals, because digital signals in nature are aperiodic, I mean, there are some, some periodic digital signals, but in general, digital signals are aperiodic, right? So there is no actual significance of using cycle because it's not periodic. But there is a meaning that we say that the bit duration is, is, is T. Okay? So the bit duration is the, uh, uh, the, the, the width of one bit. So if I can send, uh, for example, n bits per second, the width of one bit would be 1 over n. Okay? So if I can send n bits per second, the length of one bit becomes 1 over n. Okay? So there is another parameter which is less commonly used, uh, which corresponds to the wavelength that we have talked about before. It's called the bit length. Similar to the wavelength. Wave refers to the signal. Right? Here, the bit length refers to the length of one bit. But the length of one bit depends on how we propagate through the physical medium. So the length of one bit is actually the, the bit duration, which is, as we said in this example, 1 over n, multiplied by the speed of propagation. Similar to the wavelength, exactly. Okay, But because the, the digital signals are, in general, aperiodic, so instead of using the cycle duration, we use the bit duration. Okay. So, as a quick example, assume that we need to download text documents at a rate of 100 pages per minute. 100 pages per minute. So we need to, da we need to calculate the bit rate for the digital signal that can represent the, uh, uh, the, the document download. Well, um, this can be done easily. The, we have 100 pages. If we assume that each page has uh, 24 lines, 24 lines, each line has 80 characters, 80 characters, um, and each character we can represent using a, 8 bits. Or whatever, 8 bits. For that example, we're using 8 bits to represent one character. Why? Because we have 256 characters. If we, if we were to include all the special characters and symbols and so on and so forth. So we can, in general, use 8 bits per, per character. So what we need to do is that we calculate the total bit rate, and the total bit rate is a 
is we have 100 pages. Each page has 24 lines. Each line has 80 characters. Each character is represented using 8 bits. So that's the bit rate. <coughs> okay. So the so how the digital signal looks like here is is not our uh, our focus. So the digital signal looks like anything. We don't care, but we need to calculate the bit rate, and the bit rate uh, uh, is calculated based on the number of bits we can use to represent one character and how many characters we have in each page. And because in one second we have 100 pages, so that's the total bit rate. Because we want to support 100 pages to be sent in one second. Okay? Any, any question here? Is that, is that not clear? Uh, here, the, the example, that's a good question. Here, the example talks about per minute, right? And we have 100 times 24 times 80 times 8, okay? Multiply that and divide it by 60. It should be this number. If it's not, then there is a mistake in the number. Because it says here, per, per minute, and yani per 60 seconds. So we need to, to divide by 60 seconds. Okay? So the rate would be per minute. Okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I have to give you this, of course, because it, I mean, you cannot assume on your own. But th this example talks about typical numbers. So for each page, we have on the average 24, 25 lines. So let's take 24 as, as the average number of lines per page. Okay? Okay. <clears throat> so again, we talked about bandwidth to characterize the analog signal, and we said that composite analog signals, because it has, in general, uh, uh, finite frequency components, and we said that uh, in digital signals, it's uh, infinite uh, uh, frequency components, and therefore bandwidth is not useful, so we talked about bitrate. So now, the challenge is, how can we uh, transfer the digital signal over the physical medium? Okay, so people talked about two different methods, two different methods which are suitable for specific category of physical media. Okay, the the first the first method or the first category is baseband transmission. What that means is, I will take the digital signal and I will try to transfer this digital signal as is. On the physical medium. And we said that this is not possible, right? But I will make it possible. Well, luckily, if we, if we look at the frequency representation of the digital signal, we find, as I said, infinite frequency components. But if we, look, if we, if we actually look closely into these frequency components, we will find that these frequency components are decaying as you go more and more towards infinity. Which means that we can, in fact, do some approximation and use like a low-pass filter and filter out com the, the frequency components after certain limits. Okay? Like, um, like this. So we said that <clears throat> the... So we said that for uh, digital signals, the frequency components are infinite. And assuming that this is the yani, periodic digital signal, okay? So you will find that after a certain limit, the, the frequency components are still there, but the value is very, very small, which means that these frequency components do not really carry uh, much information about the signal. So we can simply use 
low pass filter and filter out these components. What you expect to get at the end is not the exact representation of the signal, it's an approximation. Okay? It's approximation. By all means, it's approximation of this digital signal. So it's not the exact representation. So this is what we call the baseband transmission. So for baseband transmission, I will take the digital signal as is, and I will try to use some low path filter. And the wider this path filter is, the better, because then I can get more and more details about the signal. Right? And then, <clears throat> Transfer this over the physical medium, which the physical medium is the low pass filter. So that, for example, the, um, uh, the coaxial cable, for example, coaxial cable has a specific bandwidth, let's say like, I don't know, like 500 megahertz or something like this. Um, so within this bandwidth, I can get uh, uh, some frequency components, but definitely other frequency components will be will be cancelled, will be ignored. So the, the, the signal that I will get at the end is going to be a little bit deformed. And we'll see how it looks like. So this baseband transmission is usually useful, is usually useful uh, when we have point-to-point -point communication, okay, with two parties are communicating and no one is interfering with them. An example of this is the LAN. In, in LANs, not wireless LAN, LANs, in LANs, in local area networks, even, even though we have hub, <coughs> we have a hub, right? But that's why we have taught you before that any two parties sending at the same time will consider this a collision. Why? Because if they send at the same time, then you have a composite signal which does not represent anyone's information. They get overlap over each other and you don't have any way to extract one from the other. Right? But in general, you have only one entity on the land sending from one point to another point. Right? So when it comes to, it, we're trying to send bits which are represented using digital signals. Okay? So what happens is that we send the digital signal using baseband transmission over the, over the land, or over the hub. What happens is that the medium itself acts as a low-pass filter, right? So you will get the digital signal on the other side with a little bit of deformation, but you can still recognize this signal and extract the bits from it. Okay? So this is the baseband transmission. <clears throat> so again, it's useful if you are sending from one point to another point and no one is, is interfering. Is there any other method? Yes. So as we said, the, the example for number one is local area network. The example, the, 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 the second method is what we call broadband. The meaning of, of the word broadband always refers to the fact that you are not sending the digital signal as is. You are actually transforming the digital signal into an analog signal. Why? Because as we said, dealing with analog signal is much easier because it's, it's, um, it's finite in terms of bandwidth and we can use uh, 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 finite frequency components to represent the analog signal, right? But in doing that, what will happen is that you will find yourself that um, you are actually shifting the frequency domain of the signal and you are transforming the signal into an analog, uh, uh, an analog signal, which means that the signal usually starts from a frequency which is not zero. And in that case, we don't use the low pass filter, we use band path filter. Band path filter is. So <clears throat> if we have. 
This is the frequency representation. Low pass filter is, looks like this. This is low pass filter. Band path filter does not start from zero and it looks like this. This is band path filter. Okay? So usually broadband transmission talks about the fact that you transform the baseband of the signal, the digital signal itself. So for example, instead of sending a digital signal like this, you convert this into an analog signal. So instead of sending a, a constant value like this, I will send something like this. I will send actually a sine wave. Okay, and then here I will send, let's say, like another sine wave, but with uh, with um, with 180 degrees or different frequency or something like that. So, um, and then zero, I will send it using zero. So I converted this into an analog signal that takes any shape, what whatever. But the good thing about this is that this this, this analog signal has finite set of frequency components, which I can which I can represent using, if it's, a, if it's a periodic signal, I can represent using finite set of samples in the frequency domain, and I, and I use bandpath filter for transmission. So the media itself, the medium that, that we use, uh, can act as a bandpath filter. An example to this is actually wireless. <clears throat> can, you, can you ever guarantee that two people are communicating using wireless that nobody else is interfering, you can never guarantee that, right? You can never guarantee that. Okay? So, <clears throat> that's why we have, we have the concept of channels, wireless channels. And this actually represents the wireless channels that we use for communication over wireless. So by, by using different sine waves, we actually shift the frequency components of the digital signal somewhere in the frequency domain. And this way we can, we can kind of isolate, for example, the Bluetooth from Wi-Fi, from 3G, from 4G, whatever. We can isolate Masan Burido traffic from Vodafone traffic, something like that. So we have to use broadband transmission. <clears throat> so the, the baseband will not work in this case because we're not using wires. Right? We're not using wires, so there is no guarantee that uh, no people are sending at the same time they would send uh, on, on, the, on different frequency. So in wireless, everybody is sending to the air. Our medium, our physical medium is the air. So we have to kind of isolate the transmission for different communication systems. And the way to do that is just to use broadband transmission, because then we can, we can control the frequency of this signal, right? And by controlling this frequency, what we do is that we actually can use um, a channel here, or here, or here, or here. So we can control the frequency range that we talk about. So by doing broadband, we have two advantages. One is that we have converted digital signal into analog, which is easier to deal with because it has a finite set of frequency components. And we can use that for our benefit to isolate the, the communication from each other. So we can use, uh, uh, so in that case, two parties or three parties can send at the same time, but a, on different frequency. In baseband, you don't have to, you cannot do that, right? In baseband transmission, we get the digital signal, we pass it over the medium as is. So we cannot allow two parties to, to, a, to send at the same time. And that's why in the LAN we have always taught you that two transmissions at the same time collide, right? We cannot do that. So the only way we can extract the digital data from the digital signal in LANs is to allow only one person to, eat, to send at the same time. Okay, so... <clears throat> Of course, we will uh, discuss each of these categories in details later on. So, uh, so first, we will talk about 
the baseband transmission and in, in baseband transmission we said that the channel and the channel here is for us is the medium okay the channel here that we talk about is the medium and the medium acts as a low pass filter because the medium has a finite bandwidth and you are sending a digital signal with infinite bandwidth so you have a low pass filter so some frequency components are going to be cut out and what you will get at the end is a little bit deformed signal okay on that this is the the bandwidth of that the, the channel represents so in in, uh, in baseband transmission we have wide band transmission and narrow band transmission and as we said before the wider the bandwidth is the more details about the same the signal we can get okay then if we if we have a channel with this frequency response then we have a more accurate representation at the end compared to a channel with this frequency response okay so this channel is better it has wider bandwidth so i can get more details in that case so so if we have a digital signal like this, as we said, bandwidth is infinite. So this is the, the frequency response. If we pass the signal through the physical medium, some of these frequency components are going to be cut out. So what I will end up with is a signal like this. And you can observe that this signal is still a little bit close to the, to the original approximation, but it's not exact representation so it cannot be exact and why why do i mean why do i have to go through that because they the bandwidth of the physical medium is finite and that's why the output signal has finite bandwidth which is equal to the bandwidth of the of the original medium of the physical medium itself so if, if i if i'm using here mesa coaxial and the coaxial has like 500 megahertz so the the signal itself, the output signal that you will get here will have a bandwidth of 500 megahertz, which is a, which is a, which is an approximation of the original signal, not the exact representation. Okay. So baseband transmission of a digital signal that preserves the shape of the digital signal is possible only if we have a low pass channel with an infinite frequency components, which in reality, it's, it's not possible. It's impossible. Okay? We do not have a physical medium with infinite bandwidth. It just does not exist. Okay? So all the physical media that we talked about in 455 and other courses, they have finite bandwidth. So in baseband transmission, we always talk about approximation not the exact representation. So this is the example that we talked about. Uh, if we have a LAN, almost every wired LAN today uses a dedicated channel for two stations. So uh, 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 a LAN here, we're talking about LAN, eh? not wireless LAN. So in local area networks, it's wired, right? So we have a wire connecting two parties, connecting two units, two computers, two laptops. Okay, so in which case, anyone will send, it will reach the other one. It's not like a broadcast or similar to wireless. Isn't it? In wireless, we send through the air, so anyone will be, will be able to receive. But in, in, in wired lands, <clears throat> we send from one point, it reaches the other point. If, if someone else is sending, then collision, I cannot, I cannot do anything. I just refrain from transmission for some time, and then I try again. That's what we have uh, studied in 455. So, uh, in a bus topology, bus topology, bus topology, something like this. Um, so, in the past, we, we, use, we use, for example, computers like this. this. In terms of physical topology, this does not exist anymore. Um, so, this is the, the bus topology. So, if anyone is sending, 
it's actually it goes through the wire. So anyone is sending here, what I'm sending is actually a digital signal. So I'm sending digital signal from any of these over the wire. If somebody else tries to send, then collision. This case, I will not do anything, halas, there's no transmission. But if no one is sending, it's actually a digital signal going through the wire. So it can be read at any point and extracted using the, the channel low pass filter. And what I will get here at this point is an approximation of this digital signal. So from the approximation, hopefully I will be able to extract the original bits and deal with it. Okay. So for this example, we, uh, uh, we very commonly use uh, baseband transmission. I don't need to convert the digital signal into an analog signal for broadband transmission. I don't need to do that. And usually this is the case for any point-to-point -point communication. For any point-to-point -point communication. The only exception to this, the only exception, is ADSL. So ADS, for ADSL, we still use wires, right? But we need isolation. Isolation from what? We use ADSL on the, on the telephone lines, right? So we use the telephone line for, for our voice communication, right? But ADSL uses the wire for it. ADSL, we use ADSL at home. So, to, to transfer it, to transfer voice, or to transfer our data from, from the computer. Hmm. We use ADSL to transfer data from computers, right? This is our means to connect to the internet. Which means that we use the ADSL for, for digital data, right? But ADSL uses broadband. So although it's a wire, yeah, but it uses broadband. Why? Because the technology of ADSL relies on the fact that we can use the telephone lines which are originally used for voice communication. We can use it for data communication. So to use the same wire for voice communication and data communication, how can you do that? And if you remember, in the past, before fiber optics now, it's a blessing that we have fiber optics at home. Our life is much easier than before. But now, but, but, but before, we actually use ADSL on the same telephone lines. Telephone lines are used for voice. So how can, we, how can we separate the voice from the data? So in that case, we use a broadband transmission. So on the same line, our voice, our voice has a very small bandwidth. So it does not actually consume the whole bandwidth of the telephone line. And this is luckily for us. Because our voice has a very small bandwidth. It has, analog, our voice can be represented using analog, analog signal, obviously. It's aperiodic, right? But the bandwidth is very small. It's actually not more than like 4K. So the telephone line has a much bigger bandwidth than 4K. So in that case, we use 4K for voice. And then we use, we use for digital uh, data communication, we use broadband transmission. We switch the digital data into the analog domain and we shift it in the frequency domain to be isolated from the voice communication. We'll talk about that again in after two slides, three slides, okay? Meshi, any questions so far? So low pass channel with a limited bandwidth, as we said, it's an approx uh, approximate the the digital signal with analog uh, 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 signal, right? And because actually when we, uh, when we chop off the frequency components, the signal becomes, it's outside of our control, the signal becomes analog, right? Because it, the approximation of the digital signal has continuous values, no matter what we do. 
You cannot do anything about it. All of a sudden, the number of levels and the signal becomes infinite. Right? Because the signal that was, that, that used to look, the signal that used to look like this, now, it looks like this. So, so this is an analog signal. It's not digital anymore. So this has infinite number of values. So no matter what you do, we'll end up with an analog signal which looks very close to the original signal, but it's not exact. Uh, the approximation depends on the available bands. If the bandwidth is wide, our approximation will be accurate and accurate. And in rough approximation, rough approximation means like very strong approximation. Yani I, I will use only very narrow frequency components from the original signal. So in that case, the signal will be very much deformed. So in rough approximation, we consider the worst case. And we will talk about this. I will talk about this in the next slide. How we can do this rough approximation for the digital signal. Okay, so we'll talk about it next time, Shalom.